provide these for you so that you can follow the sermon and the inside there. <clears throat> and also, um, just a little prayer list on the back page of Family News. And I wanted to bring your, your attention to that quickly before we get started here. And we, we've received um, phone calls and texts from friends all over the place just asking for prayers of the church. And uh, one of them is from Cheryl Winters and her husband, Mike. They, they are living up, I think, um, close to Yosemite with her parents and the whole family got COVID. And the, the brother and the father, Ray and Steve, are uh, immune compromised and they're in the hospital now. They're very sick. And so she asked if we would pray for them. And also, uh, Henry Bugelski is my son, my oldest son's father-in-law. And last oh, two weeks ago, the whole family came down with COVID. And my son and his wife and their kids, and then uh, my son's wife's brother and his fiance, and then his father-in-law, mother-in-law. And so they're all very sick. And or, I'm sorry, they're not all very sick. They all recover well except Henry. And Henry's a type 1 diabetes and... Um, so he's really struggling right now. They had a, a nurse come out and uh, give him fluids yesterday. He's on some medication for COVID, but um, they asked for our prayers as well. And Jean, Jean Brady, a sister that used to come to church here, she moved out to Palm Springs with her son Thomas, and she's 97 years old, and she fell and broke her hip, and so she just had hip replacement surgery, and she's in rehab now and doing pretty well. So uh, we want to pray for her too. And it's great to have Stacy back, of course, um, struggling with vertigo still, and we want, want to pray for her. Also, Josanne Callender's uh, book was launched, and we're excited with her for that. And she also asked us for prayers for her, her, the Wright family, her cousin, uh, who experienced an unexpected death. So there's a lot of people that have asked for our prayers, and that, that's just to mention a few. But um, we want to just take a moment before we get started here and, and pray for them. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we know that you are all-powerful and almighty and in control of all things. And Father, we, we come to you at this time just praying for these loved ones of ours. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would be with their families, be with them in their sickness, and help them, Father, uh, to put their hope and trust in you. And we pray, Lord, that you will touch them with your healing hand and, and restore them, Father, to their complete health. And we're just uh, grateful, Father, that uh, we know that, that you answer our prayers and that, that you always do what is best. Father, we trust that uh, for all these people and ask that you would be with them. Father, bless our service this morning and open our eyes to the needs of people and the ways that we can minister to them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One other announcement. Mary leaves next Friday for a couple of months. Mary... Why so long? Oh, we're going to miss you. Pray for safety and just for a really good trip. So, we started a new series of lessons last week. And it's called Sharing Your Faith 101. I felt really moved by God to to share this with you, and, and I, I just feel like the world's in a bad place right now, and people need hope. They need, they need to be encouraged, and I've had several people come up to me and just, you know, just wonder why, why, why is all this happening? You know, I had one 
friends asked me if I thought it was the end of the world and do we need to get ready for that and I told him I don't know <laughs> always be ready for it <laughs> you know? but but I mean it, it, it's it's scary to a lot of people and so uh, what what I wanted to accomplish in the series of lessons is to encourage you and spur you on to share your faith with other people and and share how God worked in your life and how he's working in your life now to give you peace and joy and hope and, and things like that. So we started with just the mandate that Jesus gave the disciples back in Matthew 28. Actually, in all four Gospels, there's a, a variation of the Great Commission. But in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And just the fact that he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, puts great emphasis on what he was about to say, to go therefore and make disciples. This is not a suggestion. It's not, you know, if you feel like it. He, he commands his followers, those who claim to be disciples of his, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And so we talked about just our mission that wherever we go, whenever we go, that we should be sharing our faith with people. And this week I want to talk about just the great need for that. I just don't think Christians do it enough, including myself. They're just not that serious about sharing their faith with other people. And what I want you to see this morning is there's this great need for it. And, and we need to, to be aware of that and be motivated by that great need. Just as Jesus was motivated to step down off the throne of heaven and come to this earth and live a poor and lonely life and minister to the needs of people and give himself up as a, a sin sacrifice for us. We need to care about people. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, Jesus looked at the world and he just saw a lot of people in misery. Overwhelmed by life and the different things that happen to us in life. Discouraged. Feeling like, you know, it's, it's just too much to bear. And he, he invited them to come to him. To find some rest. To find some peace. And I want you to know that that's the way it is right now, this day. That if you look into the world, the pandemic has just ravished people's lives. We know that thousands have died from COVID. Over 800,000 here in the U.S. And those people aren't just numbers. They're someone's mom and dad and brother and sister and aunt and uncle and child, husband, wife. Those are real people, and most of us have been touched by that. We've been touched by death of our loved ones from this horrible disease. You know, my sister joined us for Bible study on Wednesday night. She's in her 50s, and her husband died from COVID. I mean, it just breaks your heart. You know, you... You don't even have words to say. And there are so many people out there right now. My 
son's father-in-law. He's, they're scared to death for him. People are stricken with fear. I mean, people are afraid to go out of their houses. People, there are people that have stayed locked up for two years now. I think about, you know, I was watching the news the other day and they were talking about gas prices going up and they, had, they were filming this one guy at the gas station pumping his gas. He, he was triple masked and he had taken one of those wipes and had laid it over the handle of the gas pump and had picked it up very carefully to put in his car. And, and you could just see that this guy was just scared to death. There are people who haven't been to church in two years because they're scared. I mean, people are fearful. It's destroyed people's livelihoods. That just kills me that so many small businesses, so many people who invested so much of their life in getting a business of their own started and they're gone. Gone. Or people lost their jobs. Some of those people are out on the streets now living. Do you see the devastation, the destruction that this pandemic has put upon us? Maybe you're not feeling it. Maybe you're doing okay and you're, you know, you have an income and you have a nice warm house and, and you haven't been sick and but I'm telling you that there are a lot of people suffering that are weary and burdened and it's brought out the very worst in us hasn't it gosh it kills me how divided we are as a nation Divided over how to handle COVID. Whether to mask or to unmask or whether we should get vaccinated or triple vaccinated or whether we should follow, you know, the, the scientist or the scientist. And, and it's not just a difference of opinion, but there are lines drawn and hatred and anger. I heard someone on the news the other day say, you know, they ought to reject any unvaccinated person from going to the hospital. Just tell them, tough luck, buddy. How can people say stuff like that? It just blows me away. Just makes me think, you know, we, we've gotten to a place in our lives that's really messed up. People need Jesus. They need Jesus more than anything. And Jesus offers rest. He offers rest for the weary and burdened. He's the one who gives peace and joy in the midst of all this chaos and confusion that we're living in. I mean... We just finished a series of lessons on counting your blessing to, to help us to see that there's more to be joyful and happy about than there is to be depressed and discouraged. Jesus helps us with our focus on life and, and what we, we think about and what we look at. And he wants to help people. He gives us hope. I, I'm very hopeful that we are in the last throes of this pandemic. That this Omicron version is going to be the end of it. Now there may be other variants and strains that come along, but, but we're, we're moving in the right direction. We're in a good place to start getting back to normal. But people need hope. They need strength to, to keep fighting. 
through this thing until we get to the other side of it. They need help through the tough times in life, maybe financially, maybe a place to live. I want you to see that people are suffering and Jesus is the one who helps them and he uses us to administer that help. I like what he says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, even COVID, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus gives us peace. In any situation that we're in, Jesus can give us peace. Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. And in John 10.10, 10, he said, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I was reading a commentary on this, and Albert Barnes, one that I like to read, he, he says this about the, the phrase, might have it more abundantly. Literally, that they may have abundance, or that which abounds. The word denotes that which is not absolutely essential to life, but which is super added to make life happy. They shall not merely have life, simple, bare existence, but they shall have all those super added things which are needful to make that life eminently blessed and happy. That's what I try to live for, don't you? Jesus offers this, this life to the full. And again, you know, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Let me teach you about life. There's a story in John chapter 4 of the Samaritan woman at the well. You, you guys probably remember the story. Jesus is with all of his disciples. It's, he sends his disciples to go into the village and do some grocery shopping. And he sits down by the well and this Samaritan woman walks up to the well to get some water. And when she gets there. And see, here's how I picture Jesus in this situation. He sees her coming, right? He sees her coming, and I think he sees misery in her eyes. He, he sees a woman who's, whose life is hard and who has been suffering, and, and you know, she, she walks down to this well every day to get water. And, and so Jesus starts a conversation with her, asks her for a drink of water. Now, surely Jesus could have got it himself, right? So he did this on purpose, for a reason. And when he did, the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? We don't like each other. You're on that side, I'm on this side. For you Jews... Do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, and I love this little phrase. If you only knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you only knew. I mean, think about that. I think people are searching for a better life. Most people are not satisfied where they're at. They're trying to make their lives better. And many people are unhappy and discouraged and frustrated, especially right now in this pandemic. And this woman is, is you know, a lot like People we meet every day. Who's, who's had a really hard life. 
These people, they don't understand why they have such a hard life. They, they think, you know, why, why can't I have a good marriage? You remember this conversation evolves into that, where Jesus said, oh, go call your husband, have him come. And she says, well, I'm not married. And Jesus said, yeah, you're right. And the five previous ones weren't your husband's either. So Jesus knows that this woman's life has been kind of a depressing life. Maybe just used by these men and then discarded. And I can imagine her, you know, sitting at home at night thinking to herself, why can't I find the love of my life and settle down and have a family and just be happy? Why do my relationships always fail? There are millions of people out there just like that. That are just wondering, why is my life such a struggle? Why can't I have a good, why can't I find a good job? Why can't I get paid a decent wage? Why can't I, and they're, they're wondering, why is this life not working for me? See, the problem is, they don't know God. They've tried to find meaning and fulfillment in the world, but the world can't satisfy us. Never will. You see people out there thinking, wow, if I, if I could just, you know, get a better job, then I'd be happy. Or if I could just find the right person to married, then I'd be happy. Or if, I, if I could just have kids, then I'd be happy. If I, and I mean, you just fill in the blank. There's people out there that think that somehow life is going to fulfill them and give them meaning. And it doesn't do that. Remember the book of Ecclesiastes that was written by Solomon, the son of David. The richest man on earth at that time, the most powerful man there is, who could have anything he wants. And let me tell you something, he went after it. Full on. And, and he writes his little biography of how it all went down and how he thought, well, you know what? Drinking alcohol makes me feel good. So maybe if I drink a whole bunch, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be really happy then. And then, you know, he wakes up with a hangover and says, no, nah, that's not it. And then he thinks, well, you know, comedy. I love comedy. I love listening to jokes. And, and so bring the jesters in and, and, and have them, you know, tell me funny things and make me laugh. And so... Pretty soon he's laughing and rolling on the ground till his side hurts and he's, no, get him out of here. That's not it. And then he, he thinks, well, maybe, maybe I need some really beautiful, gorgeous women in my life. And so, so he, he brings in all the most beautiful women in the kingdom to do what he wants with them. And that wasn't it either. And then he thought, I'll try gardening and I'll plant vineyards and I'll try, you know, and that didn't work. And, and he, it was just one thing after another. Do you ever feel like that? <laughs> you, you know, you get your sights on something and think, well, if I could just get over this little hump here, I'm going to be okay and everything will be good then. And then you get over the hump and you meet something else. Isn't that how life works? He, he concludes the book of Ecclesiastes by saying, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. You're looking for meaning and purpose and happiness in all the wrong places. People need Jesus. That's the point. Because Jesus can provide the peace and joy and hope and strength 
and grace and mercy and all those things that make life abundant and help us to enjoy life even in the midst of all this stuff that's going on. Jesus is the author of life. We were just studying Acts 3 on Wednesday night. We're we're going to be talking about the sermon Peter preached after he healed the lame man this coming Wednesday night. Just a little plug for you to join us on Zoom for Bible study. But there, one of the things that Peter says in his sermon is, you killed the author of life. That, that really caught my attention. You killed the author of life. You see, Jesus is the author of life. He knows how life works because he designed it. He created it. He knows what makes us happy. He knows what won't make us happy. He knows, he knows everything about life. And, and so, you know, we should want to know Jesus to help us navigate life and, and to have that life that he's promised. He has the words of eternal life. I like this passage in John chapter 6 when Jesus is teaching some hard things to his disciples and, and there some of them just said, well, this is too hard, I'm leaving. And, and many of them left. Many of them, in fact, it says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus turned to the 12. He says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered, Lord, I like this. To whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. To whom do we go? And and I just think about this. When when you're discouraged and you're depressed and you're trying to find that happiness or that peace in the world and, and you feel like it's just hopeless, everything I try doesn't work, You're going to the wrong place. You need Jesus. You need God. I mean, if you want to know about finances, do you go to a veterinarian? If you want to know finances, you go to somebody who knew finances, right? If you want to know life, Jamie, I'm not picking on you. If you want to know life, you go to someone who knows life. And you know who knows life? Jesus does. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Let me, let me help you. He gives light to guide us through this dark world. In in John 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness again, but will have the light of life. 12, 46 says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. You know who wants you to stay in darkness? Satan does. Satan wants to keep you in the dark. He wants to keep you where you're unhappy and discouraged and dissatisfied because you know what people often do when they feel like that? They blame God. I mean, this whole pandemic, people blame God for. That's exactly where Satan wants us to be. He doesn't want us drawing near to God because then we'll we'll be able to get through this thing stronger and better. I think about all those years I lived in the dark. 
And I, I just couldn't figure out why my life was such a mess. I was just self-destructing. I, I, you know, I would think, well, oh, God, it's been a bad day. I'm going to go get some alcohol, get drunk, smoke a little weed. I, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, didn't fix anything. Just made it worse. Just. But when I came out of the darkness into the light, I humbled myself before God and I said, God, just, just show me where to go. Tell me what to say. Tell me what to do. I'm, I'll do it. My life was so radically transformed. I'm not saying that I didn't still have problems. I did, but, but there were problems I could handle with God on my side. And I was able to have that peace and joy that I had always wanted. Look, Jesus is the author of life. To whom shall we go? He's got the words of life. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 6.23, And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. People are spiritually lost. People are suffering. People are searching. And people are spiritually lost. When he says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, in that, that same chapter, verse 10, he says, there is no one righteous, not even one. I mean, you may not really think through this, but every day, all of us sin many times. Not just a little slip up here and there. We sin many times every single day. Sometimes unknowingly, but I would say most of the time, just doing what we know is wrong. We do it in thought, you know, how we think about people, how we view people. We, we do it in words, the things that we say to people. We do it in deeds, the way we treat others and do things that we shouldn't do. We sin every single day. And just because you come to church doesn't mean that you're better than everybody else. You're not. You're a sinner too. And sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 Verses 1 and 2, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear you. You see, God is not going to bless sin. He's just not. He's a holy God. We'll have nothing to do with it. And so while we participate in sin, we can't expect God to come rescue us when we're being disobedient to him. You know, sometimes we're, people think like, you know, I'm not going to give up the sin in my life, but, but God, keep me safe. Don't let anything bad happen to me. I was walk, watching a documentary on these drug cartels and some of these drug cartels where they smuggle, you know, thousands of pounds of cocaine and heroin across the border and stuff. They have these little shrines set up in their bathrooms of crosses and candles and pictures of Jesus. And, and you know what they're doing? They're praying that God will help them make a safe delivery to the states. Is that insane or what? Sin separates us from God. 
And the wages of sin is spiritual death. It's eternal condemnation. The little bit of discipline that we suffer in this life is nothing compared to what hell will be like. The wages of sin is death, eternal condemnation. And only Jesus can save people. John 3, 16, God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, for, for God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus came pleading with people to, to trust him and to follow him and to believe in him. Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. You know, the Bible has a horrible description of hell. A fiery furnace where the worm never dies. Eternal destruction shut out from the face of the Lord forever in darkness. I mean, you don't want to go to this place. And the reality is without Jesus, that is where people are going. Can't sugarcoat it. That's what is going to happen to people who don't put their faith in Jesus. He is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Period. Acts 4.12 says salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. He's the only hope of the world. And he came to seek and to save the lost. When you look at the ministry of Jesus, I mean, he says flat out, the, the well don't need doctors. It's the sick. Or the people that know they're sick that need a doctor. I've come to minister to the sick. And when you look at the people he was with throughout his ministry, there are people like that woman at the well. There are people like Zacchaeus who, remember, climbed up in that tree and just to get a, a view of the Lord. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to have lunch with you today. He picked out those people whose lives, who were, who were realizing that their lives weren't working for them. Wasn't, it wasn't producing what they hoped it would. And so they were looking to Jesus for some direction. And when Jesus gave it to them, it radically changed their lives. Look, people must put their faith in Jesus. In Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, another variation of the Great Commission, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that disbelieves will be condemned. That's the message. People must acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, or they'll be lost eternally. Jesus said in John 8, 24, he said, except you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Period. People need to know Jesus and put their faith in him, or they'll be lost. Does that move you at all? Does it make you think about friends or maybe family members? This should put some urgency into us. This should cause us to say, I need to share my faith. I need to talk to my, my friends, my coworkers, my children, my mom, my dad.
John, or Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38, says Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Listen to this. Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We need to share Jesus with people. I mean, there's a great need for this. We need to muster the courage. Do whatever we need to do to be able to to share our faith with other people. Jesus said, ask the Lord of harvest to send forth workers. Listen, I'm going to ask you, will you pray for our church that we'll become a force of laborers in the harvest? Will you start praying that this church, that all of our members will take these messages to heart and to really start sharing their faith with other people? We need to do that. We need to be praying for each other that that we will take these teachings to heart, that God will help us to have the same compassion for people as Jesus did. You know, Jesus saw people in a different lens, from, from, from a totally different perspective than we do. When we see needy people, we think, that's an investment of my time and my money, and then, 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 then. What, what did Jesus see? It says he had compassion on them, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When we we view people as a problem instead of a a victim, then, then we're not on the right track. People, Jesus saw people as victims of Satan who had been deceived, who had been duped by the evil one. And and were just helpless. They didn't know how to get out of it. Just like I've shared with you so many times about my own life. It's a reality. That's where people are in darkness. And can't see the way out. And so we need to bring the light to them. That's why Jesus said, Shine your light before men that they might see your good deeds and give glory to your Father heaven. This is important. We have to start seeing people with compassion and think of them not as as annoying or problems or time consuming or those kinds of things, but these are people that God loves, that God wants saved. He's not willing that anyone should perish. Every person you come in contact with, God loves and wants saved. Pray that God will use us, use you to help others know Jesus. God, send me. Send me. And then pray that God will open our eyes. You know, there's a kind of a parallel passage in John chapter 4. He said... Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus is the saying, one sows, another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Look, 
People aren't interested today in the gospel. Yes, they are. Look, you know, nobody ever really takes me serious when I ask them to come to church. Someone might. Don't, don't make excuses. Just, just recognize that there are millions of people out there that are ripe for harvest. That are just, just waiting for God to speak to them through you. And that's, that's the whole picture here. That we're praying, God, open my eyes to the opportunities everywhere. And then make the most of those opportunities. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God pro- prepared in advance for us to do. Do you realize that there's, there's an opportunity waiting for you out there that God prepared in advance for you to do? I mean, think about that. Just, it blows me away sometimes. Just, just the other day, I got a phone call from South America from a guy that used to go to church here. And he's struggling with addiction. And he thought to call me. Oh man, I'm so glad he did. And, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking how God's prepared situations in our lives that we will engage with other people and share our faith with them and help them to put their faith in Jesus and to, to grow in their spiritual walk. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Use whatever gift you have received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. All of us have something to share with others. Share it. And I'll close with this verse in Colossians chapter 4. This was the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Colossae. And these were the, the, some of the last words he wrote to them. He said, devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. And pray for us too. That God may open a door for our message. So that we may proclaim it, the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. (laughs) Paul, in prison, saying, pray for me that I'll be able to to share the mysteries of Christ while I'm in prison here. Can you imagine being his guard? (laughs) You got an earful every day, I'll bet. Pray for us too. And then he says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. As we go out to share our faith with others. Be wise how you act in the presence of other people. In other words, don't be doing stupid things. We're going to talk about do's and don'ts of sharing your faith in another sermon, but, but don't realize that people are watching. And there's an old saying, I'd rather see a sermon any day than hear one. That's true. So when you go out and you look for opportunities to show compassion and kindness and goodness to people, you're sharing your faith. You're sharing your faith and that has an impact on people. I hope and pray. that we will do our very best to share our faith with other people. 
That's what our Lord has called us to do. And whatever is holding you back, I hope that you'll be able to get past that. And if, if you're having trouble with it, come talk to me and let's pray together and, and let's see if we can work through it. But we all need to have people sitting next to us that we have invited to come to church. People need Jesus. Do you believe that? Yeah. Let's do what we can to really share our faith with others. We're going to sing a song in closing. Mel picked out the song. Let's all be standing as we sing the song together. <laughs>